You're now listening to Off the Collar. Powered by Backswing Golf Events. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Off the Collar. It's your host, Nick Johnson. We have a very anticipated uh, episode this week. Uh, Shelby is indisposed again. Uh, I think uh, this would have been a great time for her to get some dirt on me. Uh, she's going to have to get in on another episode like this. Um, but before I introduce our guest for this week, I just want to thank you guys out there that's, that are listening. We just reached a milestone of 500 listens on the podcast, which is, you know, maybe not, doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that's pretty awesome in terms of podcasting. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys for listening. We're going to keep, uh, keep motoring on and, and it's been, been a fun journey. It's crazy to think I've been doing this for like four or five months already. Um, but without further ado, our guest of the week, Jeremy Sanders, uh, who is my former teammate at University Redlands. Jeremy, thanks for joining. How's it going? Good, good. Thank you for having me. And I also want to thank your listeners too, because uh, you need a win and uh, getting to 500 <laughs> listens is pretty awesome. So thanks, guys. <laughs> I, I need I need a win. I don't know if we want to unpack that. Um, well, <laughs> well, it is it is awesome to, to see that, you know, people are enjoying listening to this. Um, speaking of which, uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you know, but our teammate Bobby Holden is one of our top listeners um, who neglected to be on this episode. So in, in light of that, I think this is an opportune time just to, to roast him in front of uh, a worldwide audience. Um, <laughs> well, we know for sure he'll be listening. Well, we know for sure he'll be listening. He, he might give me a very stern talking to. Um, so a little bit about our team before we get into Jeremy's story. So University of Redlands was a D3 school that uh, we played at, um, what year was it, Jeremy, between, I graduated high school, 2010, so 20, 2010. 2010 to 2012, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, Jeremy yeah. transferred to Pepperdine after his first two years there. Um, stole stole my move i was gonna do that i was gonna transfer to a d1 after a couple of years but um we'll go into into why i didn't in a second here um but we have basically and, and kudos to our coach we had a very solid recruiting class we had um was it four of us in our year and then we had two extras that joined maybe three that really solidified the team um, going into my senior year, um, which uh, we were number one in the nation for 16 weeks. Um, I would say I was a big part of that, but I was a, a minimal part of that. Um, <laughs> we had the number one player in the nation, which definitely helps. Uh, but we, uh, we have a lot of, of stories between Jeremy and myself. I would say Jeremy knows me probably better than anyone out there, which is, you know, that's a, that's a heavy burden for you to, to carry. Um, you know, how, how, how do you deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, I just got to keep my eye on the tech, on my text messages to make sure I don't miss anything <laughs> that comes through from you. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I got to throw it. We, do have, on a, the we do have a solid sure text chain. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I always, I'm always throwing in likes on your, uh, your random ass comments that don't really make any sense, even in context. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been great knowing you, Nick, and uh, I love, uh, love that you're doing the podcast. I'm a huge fan. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a hell of a ride since 2010. That's for sure. And we'll be right back after this quick commercial break. This episode is brought to you by Riverside.fm. If you guys are wondering how I put together these podcasts on a weekly basis, it's all with the software I use behind the scenes. I uh, started using Riverside.fm pretty much immediately. And the main reason I use them is it is so convenient for all of my guests. I can send them individual links, basically just joining in like it was a Zoom call. It's very convenient for everyone involved and makes editing a breeze with all different sorts of AI 
and different capabilities that Riverside brings to the table. If you guys want to start your own podcast, go to my link in bio and put in the code OTC15. Just like off the collar, OTC15 for 15% off. Really do give this thing a try. It gave me everything I needed and more makes my life so much easier when it comes to distributing and editing all these different episodes I do. Riverside.fm. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, I would argue part so, of my charm is not understanding a hundred percent of what I say. Um, so <laughs> we're just going to keep, we're just going to keep riding with that. And hopefully, uh, hopefully the listeners at home can just, uh, be in the passenger seat. Um, but I, I want to go into a few things with with you a little bit, um, you know, about we know each other really well, like I mentioned, but I don't think I knew a whole lot of your story coming up, you know, from junior golf into playing collegiately. I mean, you you were our captain my freshman and sophomore year pretty much instantly. Like you came in, you know, ready to go. Um uh, what remind me and, and the audience, your accolades from that freshman year and, and sophomore year, I think if my memory serves freshman year was one of the record setting years, I mean, you had a really good sophomore year as well, but. Yeah. Um, I was, yeah, I got to think back. So I was freshman of the year for sky after conference. And then I was first team all American because I think mostly because I finished fifth place in nationals solo that year. And I think our, our team ended up doing pretty well too. I think we came in 10th or so that year and, uh, you know, one, I don't, I don't remember exactly how many tournaments, but I think I won one or two my freshman year. And then I think I won one my sophomore year. And, uh, that year I came in third at nationals and was also first team all American. Um, and yeah, it was that, that year we came in fifth, or either fourth or fifth in, in, as a team at nationals, I think fourth, because Butch was pretty pissed that we didn't get a medal or a trophy. <laughs> I think, I think it was, I think it was, it was fifth. Cause they gave us, tr- they gave us trophies all the way up to fourth place. So it had to be fifth. Okay. Um, so it's fifth then. Yeah. Cause he would have, he would have been a little happier if you guys brought home some, some medal for sure. Um, so t- tell me, like, what was your recruiting process like? Like, what made you choose Redlands initially? I'm still remember. I'm trying to think back. Like, we actually didn't even meet, go- like, on the golf course. You and I met during like orientation, which was super random. Yeah, super random. So, <clears throat> leading up to school, I, you know, my family. I was. I'm the. I have a younger brother, but I'm the oldest child, and playing a sport. My parents didn't really play sports competitively at all their whole lives. Um, my dad was into golf and played golf and he's a, he was a pretty good player and still plays a lot. <laughs> um, but they didn't really have an idea of how junior golf worked or college golf. So we were really just trying to figure it out as we went. And, um, I didn't know much at all. I just was trying to play in as many tournaments as I could practice. You know, I just loved golf. So I wanted to just do that as much as possible. And luckily I had parents who were willing to take time off. I think back and I'm like, Jesus, the amount of PTO they used over the summers to take us to golf tournaments, the amount of money spent on rental cars and hotels and oh my God, plane tickets. It was crazy. So, I mean, I owe them a lot and I, um, I really appreciate everything they've done. But so all that being said, didn't really know much, but Butch somehow, my mom loved Butch, first of all. So Butch Edge is our was our college golf coach at the University of Redlands. He is a very unique guy. I mean, when we met him, he was he's like six six feet tall and probably weighed about 300 pounds. He was built like a linebacker for football. Bald head and the most charming, funny, just like personable guy you could ever meet. And so I, we clicked, my mom loved him. I loved him a lot. Um, and he was like, you know, I've tried 
you know, just recently took over this team. He was the assistant coach for a while and um, he took over the team as head coach and he was saying he's got some good players coming in. I didn't really, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't get a lot of attention from D1 schools at the time. And so I, what my focus was, was going somewhere where I could play golf and get better, essentially, was my plan. I didn't really think about ever transferring at the time. I knew that, you know, people said that's always an option, but it didn't really cross my mind. All I wanted to do was get in there and play some golf. I didn't really, so yeah, I guess that's really the story. Butch, uh, Butch came out to watch me for a tournament that I had near, close by to Redlands, and uh walked with me for I think a full 18 or maybe nine holes or something but uh uh yeah uh, once at once we kind of met a couple of times and I got to tour the University of Redlands and did it overnight we had talked about that recently our overnight experiences which were I don't know how we chose Redlands for those but uh it was it was a hell of a time and uh yeah <clears throat> I think just having somebody who's interested in me at the time um they had, it was a good school. It was, um, had good, you know, golf races fr from all I knew. I didn't really know anything, but, um, right. you know, Butch talked a good game. <laughs> and he, so that, that's really how it's, I uh, landed at Redlands. It, it's funny. Like a lot of, we need to have him on the podcast cause he has, I think a lot of our stories are his stories. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's come out of yeah. his mouth at some point or, or he's a, a direct contributor to a lot of our stories. Um, but I think, yeah, let's, let's dive into some of the overnight, <laughs> overnight things. Um, I think our, our situations were very similar. I started kind of late. I didn't do like AJGA stuff or anything like that until maybe I was like 16, 17, which is pretty late for like junior golf. Like there's kids now that have, yeah you know, they're 12 years old and they've been playing AJGA stuff for like 10 years, which is, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it's a different world. Um, I do want to comment too on like our parents, I think maybe other sports might be a little different, but our parents being there to help with travel and playing tournaments, you're basically like a professional golfer at, at a very young age. Right. And this is way before like remote work was even a thing. So I don't even know how they were able to do that. Like there's a, it makes me nervous for the future. Like if I ever have children, like how do you, how do you, you know, separate yourself from the, the duties you got to do as a, a parent and, you know, a husband and pay your bills, but also like, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll have to deal with that later on the road. Let me, let me get a girlfriend first and then maybe a wife and then <laughs> we'll, we'll go in, in baby steps. Um, even though I'm sure yeah. I have a, a, illegitimate child out there somewhere um <laughs> but speak <laughs> i loved how, how you're dead quiet after that is like yeah that's probably true <laughs> yeah, that's probably true that's probably true <laughs> yeah um that's 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 for the the next podcast the off the car after dark um <laughs> I do, I do want to congratulate you though. You just got engaged uh, a couple weeks ago um, to, I, I think you. she's in the room with you. She, am I allowed to, am I allowed to talk to her while she's right there? Uh, no, she can't hear you. So you're good. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, you told me that she is a fan of, of me, which I definitely doubt. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the kind words. I'm a fan of hers. Her, so yeah, she, is a, she is a big fan. Um, you know, I, I, I can, I can charm like one out of 10 ladies and she would happen to be the one, the 10%. Um, Dude, you had, you had to waste that's some it quick on math her. I did there. See, I went to, I went to college <laughs> for that. <laughs> I wasted it on her. Um, Dude, yeah, you might have. You but, might have a girlfriend. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really happy for else. it. <laughs> um, that's uh, yeah. I think that's for another another podcast too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, congrats on congrats on the wedding. I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, so hold on with me. Um, or congrats on on the marriage, the proposal. Why don't you give us a little bit of an idea? Cause this is a pretty funny story. Like what, 
what went into the process like i i know what did obviously but i i think the story needs to be told because it's pretty funny okay so um basically i i've been going back to uh grad school part-time so i don't i don't have quite a, as much time as i used to and uh i have these little breaks in between each term so i had two weeks um for my summer break and I had been planning maybe five months ago that I was going to ask her on this break. And so out of no, and I was, I was thinking, trying to figure out, should I, we go on a trip? I should plan something. And out of nowhere, she just says, Hey, I have a surprise for you. I booked us a little weekend getaway during your summer break. And this was like four months ago. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is, she's like kind of ruined my plan. I was going to book, do something, but now if I do something outside of what she's doing, already done, has planned for us, it's going to look weird and she'll be tipped off to what I'm to probably thinking of doing. So right. basically, right. Don't she planned her own. Yeah, exactly. So she basically planned her own engagement trip and, and at me asking her. So she did all the hard work. She basically surprised me <laughs> with a, like a little Airbnb stay at a farm in Fillmore, which is maybe. 45 minutes outside of LA or outside of the San Fernando Valley. And, uh, <clears throat> so I basically sheeted up for me and, um, there happened to just be an awesome little area just outside the farm property is a 10 acre avocado farm. And at the end of it, there was a levee that you could climb up on and look over the whole Fillmore Valley, uh, whatever Valley that is in Phil that Fillmore sits in. But, uh, so at sunset, we went over there and, I proposed just the two of us. It was perfect. Um, for anybody out there who's thinking of doing something like that, highly recommend just bringing your your phone and like a little tripod, setting something up and say, you know, like the, what I did was told her, let's just take some nice pictures. It's going to be beautiful out. We'll get dressed up and some pictures. And we had done that before, luckily. So she wasn't phased by that. She's like, okay, um, sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. Right. And uh, I just took a video as I did it. And then you can kind of take some screenshots from there of good moments. Um, so you can have those for, you know, cause everybody's going to ask you for pictures. Right. Right. Like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, 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 like me. So for the listeners out there, I called him before he was trying to like plan this all out. And I was like, Brittany's Brittany's your fiance's name. Wow. That's the first time I've said that out loud. That, that feels funny. Um, but Brittany's your fiance. And, I was like, dude, she's going to propose to you on this trip. <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're thinking you're going to do it. And I, and he's like, did dude, I get your head a little a bit? Sec. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, yeah, after, I just we picture... up, after we got off the phone. Yeah. No, you had me worried for sure. After we got off the phone, I was legitimately thinking about it. I'm like, holy crap, she might be planning on it. I mean, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to do. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just pictured, I just pictured you both like on your knees next to each other, proposing each other at the same time. (laughs) Like (laughs) it's not, it's definitely something that you two would do. Like I wouldn't have been surprised at all. Um, and it is, it is kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ironic or just that she kind of planned out your proposal (laughs) to a certain degree. Like she didn't know you were doing it, but she planned the location and <laughs> set the venue. <laughs> yeah. Basically set it up for me perfectly. Uh, she's a mind reader. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> um, so <laughs> any girls out there listening, you know, that's maybe a possibility too. just set up a nice little weekend for you two to get away. And um, your boyfriend might yeah. pop a question. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was actually thinking, so this is fun, something funny that has come up like, I'm trying to trying to get back into playing golf a little bit more. So I have I have a tripod actually it's sitting over here. I use it for the podcast as well. But I think that's something very specific to golfers to like film their swing, right? You're not playing basketball filming your motions very often. Like maybe you are, but especially golfers, you you have so much usage for a tripod, right? So I have yeah. one and it folds up really easily. Um, but you bring up a good point is like, you need to be able to explain why you have a tripod with you. Right. It's like me, my excuse would be, I have a podcast. We could just use this for content. Right. But 
a normal Joe, like I, I applaud you for being able to like just pop out a tri tripod. <laughs> so funnily, I forgot the like normal tripod that we that I was planning on using, which is just like a yeah. full standing tripod. But instead, I used this one here. The little like I, I just have that one in my car. This little yeah. you know foot high tripod that can wrap around your golf bag or a bag stand. Yeah. So I had yeah. that. Luckily, I let I always have that in my car, and I happened to be like, "Oh crap! I forgot the actual tripod." But we can I could use this, <laughs> so it worked out. Well, thank thank well thank God you're a golfer. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had that tripod. Yeah, exactly. Car. I feel like exactly. I feel like every golfer out there should have a tripod ready and available. The ones with the arms are like the best ones. I remember in college that was it you or was it Gomberg that would always put the phone like in the bag, like try to slide it in between the clubs and then take a video. Maybe it's Bob. Yeah, that's me. I was doing that even right before I got this, I was still doing that. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I take it out, you know, when I'm on the range or something, it's a douchebag move. I, I feel it a hundred percent. Like it doesn't, it doesn't feel good when I pop it out, but I'm not, I don't want to ask a random dude to take a video of me when I have this thing. So it's more it's more for the embarrassment of asking somebody for help than anything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, let's let's get into uh, what I actually wanted to talk to you about. So, and this is something I wanted Shelby to come in on, and maybe she can she can bring it up in the next episode. But whether you're aware of it or not, which I think you might be, I've never actually won a golf tournament before. I've won two club championships at Ahoy Country Club, which I don't, I mean, a win's a win, I suppose, but I kind of, I grew up playing there, so I don't really count it, but I've never actually won like an actual tournament. So this is kind of what I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into is like, one, you obviously had that success and won multiple times, probably oh, like a good amount outside of just college golf too. Um, I mean, your, your brother was very successful at, at UW. Maybe we should have gotten Johnny in here um, as well. He, but I'm he curious. Can tell you about <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is another topic that I've brought up uh, like in passing, but I always think since you guys were very close in age and you've seen it on other sides too, you had that competition all the time. Right. And it, it helped that you guys were very competitive and had a lot of um, your skill level was very high. But it's like you're not searching for competition ever. He's always with you. Right. Right. How much I mean, let's go into that a little bit, too, is how much do you think having him pushed you? And maybe the other way around is like, how much do you think him having you pushed him? Um, and, and then I want, I want to go into like what your process is in, in winning. Like I help me, help me win a golf, golf tournament. I'm 31 years old and haven't won a golf tournament yet. Like we gotta, we gotta get some W's going. Like this is getting a little ridiculous. Yeah. I need two club championships, man. Uh, I would have thought you'd be racking them up by now. So we got to really work on that for you. <laughs> Uh, that's coming I've from only played in two, so. <laughs> Hey, well, that's not a bad record, though. Well, <laughs> I think the issue is maybe you're not playing it enough. Probably not. Definitely not now. Um, yeah. So, so, but to answer yeah, your question, I think it's a really that's that's I think it's a really good question that you asked Nick about having a brother and how that affected me and probably him. I mean, I can't speak for him, but having somebody there to always, I mean, we're first off, my brother is about two, a little over two years younger than me. We were only two grade apart in school and, uh, we, we were really close growing up. Um, you know, we always like my friends were his friends and his, I, I became friends with some of his friends. So we were always, you know, we don't, not that we always hung out there, but, um, when we were hanging out with friends, but we always were together, you know, at home, at the golf course, we both grew up playing golf and, um, it, it definitely was really competitive, but we had like a really close bond, I would say to where, you know, it never really got between us. Like, yeah. I would get really pissed if he did beat me or even in like a chipping contest or putting contest or, 
um, which we would have all the time, you know, growing up, it was really nice to have somebody who was, you could compete against. And like, I mean, we had our skill sets. He, I was definitely a better putter than him. And he was always, it has been and probably ever be a better chipper than I am. Um, but you know, being able to have that person there to play, to just chip around with till nine o'clock at night over this during the summers. And, uh, you know, like you're just coming up with random stuff to, to bet up, bet on or compete, yeah. compete with them again. So I think that was pretty huge to have <clears throat> someone like that always pushing you. And I think that really prepared me for college and qualifying, you know, you're it's qualifying is a really interesting dynamic. So this is qualifying for, uh, tournaments while you're on a golf college golf team. You, some, a lot of times coaches will have qualifiers to see who plays in the actual tournaments themselves. And so, um, you know, having, always having that person that you're competing against, like with qualifiers, it's kind of like you're, you are playing your own game, but it's kind of feels like match play because you're, I mean, you're playing against a few guys to make it to this tournament. Right. And so, um, I, I mean, I think, I think that was, yeah, really helpful because I didn't feel like I was not a great player growing up, going back to junior golf. I guess I played in some AGAs, the ones that were low, the ones that ended up close by to me in Southern California. I would play in and then I traveled for one. And uh, I think, you know, never really had any success in those. Played in a lot of the Toyota Tour Cup. It was called the Toyota Tour Cup back then. I don't know what it's called now, but, you know, SCGA stuff, but tried, just was always trying to get into the best tournaments I could. And then my mother, um, you know, he got start. we got started playing golf, like seriously at, at the same time. So he was kind of two years, he had two years on me as far as, um, he started playing competitively two years earlier than I did. And, uh, so I started playing my first tournament at 13, maybe 14. And so he would have been 11 or 12. And, um, right. we, you know, us, he, he, he won an AJGA event. It's, freaking crazy story he got stung by a seaman at the bottom of his foot and he goes he's like can barely he's limping he can't put full pressure on his right foot so he's swinging with his heel elevated in the air ends up winning a AJGA I think he won in a playoff against Bo Hostler funnily enough so so you know that then got him into all the invitationals and stuff and so he he played in quite a few big junior golf events and uh, won another pretty big one called the Orange Bowl, the Junior Orange Bowl, and uh, mm. so yeah, he. Uh, but yeah, I think for him it was great to have an older brother who, like you know, when he, like when he was playing, he had nothing to lose. Like if he lost to me, it was no big deal. But if he won, right. he knew it was going to piss me off, and so I always had that same feeling where like I always felt like I had to win, and so I don't know. I think it benefited both of us in different ways, but. Um, was really helpful overall. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember playing with you guys for the first time at your home course, uh, Calabasas country club. And I hadn't seen your brother. I maybe met him a few times at your house or something, or maybe when he came to visit at Redlands, but I don't think I've ever seen him like play golf. Like this is kind of early stages before like Instagram or anything where you could, you would see somebody swing before you even met them. Now it was before like back how it used to be. And I remember like I don't know why but you would assume two brothers who grew up in the same place would have a similar move right your guys's moves are totally like not even close to the same like I would say your brother swings like Chris Kirk a little bit would be the first guy I, I kind of would think of it's like it's it, there's not a whole lot of tension like it's yeah. almost like he's not even trying to swing at it um I'm almost a little bit surprised that he hits it as straight as he does. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it doesn't, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot to it where yours is very like yeah. definite and a very like, like I'll give you a compliment. I loved watching you swing. Like you're one of the best ball strikers. I remember you and Bobby uh, were one, some of the best iron players I've I'd seen up to that point. Like you play, you both played blade irons, which I always thought was like, I grew up thinking blades were too hard to hit. Now I'm playing blades, with, which is the irony. Um, but <laughs> both the, both your your moves were just so compact and clean. 
Um, but there, there's always some, I don't know, you, you probably don't feel it because you're accustomed to it. But whenever, whenever I would stay at your house and we're just hanging out, and it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty funny, uh, I don't know if the house is still in the same shape, but it's a pretty funny place to stay in the Sanders family. Your parents are always in their two chairs, like their designated chairs. They probably fall asleep around 9 o'clock, 9.30. Um, and then you and your brother were pretty much like foam rolling for an hour and a half, maybe, maybe hop in the hot tub a little bit, but it it was like a, a, a full on like recovery session in the living room while the golf is on or whatever. But there's, there's like a sense of brotherhood between you and a sense of like fuckery between you. Like you kind (laughs) of, you kind of care, you kind of care about each other, but you also kind of like giving each other shit, which is a funny, a funny dynamic. Um, We we might have to, yeah. Yeah. You, you, maybe we should, well, Johnny's in the UK right now, isn't he? Yeah. But he'll be back in a few weeks. Right after, I was thinking we should, after Labor Day. I was thinking we could call him right now and, and get him on the pod, but uh, it's probably pretty late over there right now, and I don't think my anytime minutes would work that far. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a very interesting dynamic. Well, let's go into that other part of the, the question. Um, so you're pretty infamous for uh, <laughs> not to throw you under the bus. But every time you were in contention, you had to go to the bathroom. Like it's 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 on record that like I remember watching you at a tournament. I think it was Red Hill Country Club. I didn't make the make the team, but I was going out to watch you guys, or or maybe I finished playing. I I don't remember. But you were in contention. You had like four or five holes to go, and I would see you hit a shot, and then you would disappear in the woods, and then you'd come back, and and then. <laughs> <laughs> hit your shot and then disappear again like you probably have the smallest bladder of anyone i've ever met but oh, what yeah. what is going through <laughs> what is going through your head maybe when you're playing on say day one versus like day three or four in contention at a tournament like is it the same mindset does it change as you're going like i think that's something i've always struggled with is i don't know what kind of mindset I should have throughout a tournament. And you might have a little more insight on that. Yeah. Um, I, I always, I, I never thought too much about mindset. I always just tried to do the same thing always and just be really consistent. Um, so I, I drank a lot of water. I always felt like <laughs> the more I peed, like to answer your question about the comment of being in the woods all the time, so yeah, I, I tried to drink as much water as possible that I, cause I felt like the more I peed, the better I played. I don't know what, what I was thinking back then, but, um, that was my, my that was part of my mindset. No, there, there is something, there is something to it. I've hit some clutch shots when I had to go to the bathroom. Like it's yeah, I knew, yeah. <laughs> the sense of urgency. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, my mom made the comment a while back when she was watching me play with that. It would, she would always be so nervous watching me play, especially towards the end of a round, because I was always going into the woods, and she was, would always think like, "Oh my God, did he hit his drive over there?" And then I would just, uh, she'd see me like running back out to the fairway, <laughs> and she's like, "Oh my God, what, he's just got to pee again." What the funniest thing is is, and maybe this is somewhere where we bonded, but both our moms were like four foot eleven. So they're on the shorter side. So, so watching, yeah. watching them like scurry into the woods to find your ball is probably one of the funniest things to watch. So anyway. Oh yeah. Well, my mom, my mom, I, I had the pro- where our problem was that she would hang back way too far. So she would be on the phone or, you know, I, I don't know, but she would be getting in the people behind the, the kids behind us way um, as we were playing. So I always was worried about her, you know, not keeping up. She would, but she, she started to get pretty good at that towards the end of uh, watching us play as we got older. But, but yeah, um, as far as mindset, though, there's a lot of really good books about it. Um, my favorite was Fearless Golf by Gio Valente. And um, there's another one called The Inner Game of Tennis, which has a lot to do with learning how to learn something um, and then how you should, you know, play when and get in the zone and stuff. And those two books were 
awesome. Um, the I remember, you know, just really my main thing was focusing on, and it's a, easier to to like understand the importance of it now, kind of with the view of hindsight or with the ability to have hindsight view on a lot of these things and not have anything invested in playing golf anymore. Um, <clears throat> but just you know, un fully understanding that you're not going to play perfect golf. I mean, even you look at like some of the greatest rounds ever, 59s and stuff, there are putts that they missed that could have gotten them to 58 or 57. So, you know, there's also going to be shots out there that you miss. And it's, um, you know, really that that's one thing that I wish I understood more. And I tried to understand back then is, you know, be, being okay and understanding that there's going to be missed putts, missed chips, missed everything, um, even in a good round. Um, the other thing to it is uh, one thing that I always felt really was helpful to me, especially in qualifiers. I found that I played really well in qualifiers. I ended up qualifying for sectional. I mean, I got through local qualifying at the USM three times and then almost made it to, I missed a playoff for, um, at sectionals to get into the U or I missed a playoff to get into the U S open by a shot and then played in the U S am twice, two years ago and, uh, missed qualifying for that by a shot my third year. So <laughs> I think the one thing though, that helped me with qualifiers, especially was knowing that everyone feels nervous before round and that the guys who are going to do better than others are the guys who could just cope with those nerves um, better than others. So like understanding that I was going to be nervous and just kind of helping self realize that everyone feels this way kind of calmed me down. You know, it really makes you feel like you're not, you're not the only one out there who's like hands are sweating and shaking a little bit on the first tee or, uh, you know, understanding that if you're like, I remember <laughs> shaking uh like me to qualify for the second usam that i played in <clears throat> i had like a four footer on the last one and i kind of figured it was to make it and i it was probably the most nervous i'd ever been oddly enough and uh i mean i was like i was shaking like crazy and still made the putt and I'm like god i can't imagine um you know, what, what it must be like to know that like for the FedEx cup, for example, to come down to the last hole, knowing you need to make par on the last hole to win the FedEx cup, you know, 15 million or $18 million. Um, but those guys still, even with shaky hands and, um, you know, heart beating out of their chest, they're still able to maybe not make a good stroke, but make a putt, you know? So kind of understanding right. that helped, helped me a lot. But, um, there are some times too, like some of the, to thinking back on some of the tournaments one, you're just in a zone, like on another plane almost. You're just playing right. like some sort of golf that you know, you're you're not nervous, your confidence is through the roof. I'll never forget. Um uh there's a putt at nationals at, um that I made for Birdie for us our team to make the cut. Um, one of my freshman year yeah. and I don't know where this confidence came from, but I was at a four footer that broke, you know, I had to just start the ball outside the hole and it was downhill, um, for birdie. And I knew it was going to go in like watching the ball s stop on the green after I hit that pitching wedge. I mean, it was a weird, sometimes you get, you're lucky in the sense where things just are easy and you kind of have that confidence, but I think it comes from all those things, you know? like knowing you're going to miss shots and just being okay with that, you know, you're not going to like have this extra tension of trying to play perfectly. Um, knowing that everybody gets nervous and you can still play well, even when you're nervous. Um, and then really another thing was just focusing on it's the, all the cliches, you know, one shot at a time, the most important shots, right. the next shot you're going to hit, um, right. you know, not looking, looking, I think, uh, looking at a bad shot. Yeah. No, go ahead. I, th I think you bring up something that actually came up today. I this think has been Off the Collar. Powered by Backswing Golf Events.